people instructions again. And then, of course, everyone will be on mute until uh, we actually start uh, the Q&A part of the discussion. So please do use those tools to enter questions if you have them. We'll uh, interrupt Jack periodically to address them if they're timely. Otherwise, we can talk about them at the end. So just hang tight. We'll start in five minutes. Hi, everyone that's uh, waiting. Uh, we're going to get started in just uh, two minutes here, uh, top of the hour. So uh, just make sure you can get access to the Q&A. And uh, there's a link there to a Google document if you are unable to use the Q&A tool inside of Zoom, which is the, the webinar uh, tool. So make sure you can get access to those so you can answer que uh, ask questions. Uh, I'm sorry I was mistaken before. Uh, you'll be on mute the whole time just to make sure that Jack uh, doesn't get interrupted. So uh, you, you'll have to ask your questions through that tool in order to, to get a response. Thank you. We'll start in just a minute. Okay. 
Okay, well, let's get started. Uh, this is our seventh session in a series of best practices uh, for HPC software developers webinar series. Uh, today we have uh, Jack Deslip who's going to talk about uh, uh, performance experiences that he's had here at NERSC uh, with the upgrades that we're going through to uh, Cori Phase 2, which is a new Intel Knight's Landing machine. Uh, before we go into that, though, uh, I want to make sure that you can see the basic slide, and it's really important to us to keep track of this. Um, obviously, we're doing this as part of a, a, a outreach motivation in uh, our projects, and it's uh, a good thing to build the community of HPC developers and uh, make sure you have access to other webinars or seminars and resources as we bring them online. So please do make sure you get counted. There's a, a bit.ly URL on the slide right here. Uh, you can go ahead and uh, enter uh, your registration in that. Second of all, we do encourage questions, but uh, we uh, need to mute all the other lines here to make sure that Jack's not interrupted and we don't have background noise. I'm sure we've all experienced that. So please do use the Q&A tool that's with the webinar, or you can type them into the Google Doc. We have people that are monitoring those, and we'll bring them up. Um, so uh, please do uh, make sure that you're uh, asking questions. I'm sure uh, Jack's going to be able to address them at some point. Um, the second thing is we are recording this, uh, and the slides will be available soon. So uh, just look at the link there that's on the screen, and uh, we'll also probably send that out afterwards. I'll double check with uh, with our hosts. And then last, uh, you know, this series uh, has a number of topics, and we had some very generous volunteers offer uh, to present those topics. If you have more ideas or material or content that you'd like to see in series like this, this is the last of this series, but we'll probably be starting up another one. Please do send that uh, feedback to HPC Best Practices plus session 07 at gmail.com. Uh, that allows us to kind of put the feedback in the context of whatever was presented that day, and we're gathering it for the next round. Finally, for those of you that are going to supercomputing, uh, we also have a, a hefty tutorial that we're hosting on uh, HPC testing uh, for scientific software. And uh, that's going to be at Supercomputing 16 this year in November. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce Jack. Uh, Jack Deslip uh, has been here at NERSC for about five years. His background is in uh, material physics. He got his degree from UC Berkeley uh, right next to the LBNL NERSC campus here. And he's the acting lead of Application Performance Group here at NERSC. Uh, his group works with users to prepare apps for the next uh, generation of Cori machine, which is an Intel Knight's Landing system uh, in collaboration with Cray and kind of the broader uh, computational science community at NERSC. And so uh, most of the things he's uh, uh, focusing on with his team are optimization concepts, and uh, even the process and approaches are what we call in the project the how-tos to optimize code, and uh, particularly targeting many core architectures like the KNL that we're, uh, we're porting to here at NERSC. So with that, I'd like to give the presentation back to Jack. All right, thanks, Han. Um, so I think with, with Han's introduction, I don't have to tell you what I'm going to tell him tell you about, but here's the, uh, here's the agenda for the next roughly 50 minutes or so. I'm going to give a brief overview of the difference between many-core and multi-core uh, HPC systems. And I'm going to talk about the various concepts that I think are required to discuss optimization and then kind of unveil an optimization strategy that I think um, is hopefully uh, simple enough that, that everybody on the line can, can go off and apply it to their codes. One of the nice things about being at NERSC is that we have many, many users, over, uh, uh, over 500 or 600 different projects, and it really challenges us to think about, um, about how to generalize and come up with solutions that kind of work across, uh, across the board on a, on a large range of applications. And then in the end, I'll, I'll sort of go about applying some of the strategy to, to uh, a, an example application in, in a real case study. So the first part is, is about many core. And uh, a lot of you are probably thinking, why, why, do I, why, why do I care about many core? And I think the reason to care is that the, the many core systems are really now beginning to, to come. Um, you know, NERSC has traditionally been fairly conservative um, because we have to support such a large user base of procuring machines that support applications at large. And I think uh, when NERSC procures a mini-core system, 
you can clearly see that that's uh, the direction that we think the HPC community is going in. And there are many core systems coming to the ALCF, other centers around the world. And most of the uh, lessons learned here also apply to the GPU systems being deployed at, for example, Oak Ridge and uh, some, of the, some of the other HPC facilities throughout the world. So NERSC's uh, next generation system that's actually just arriving downstairs uh, as we speak is called Cori. All of our systems are named after, uh, after scientists. And so Cori is named after uh, Gertie Cori, who is the first American woman to win the Nobel Prize in Science. Um, Cori will be our, um, uh, the machine at NERSC that will begin to transition our workload to energy efficient architectures. And so it's going to contain, as, as Hans said, over 9,000 Intel Knights Landing based uh, compute nodes. And so what is different about this? Why, why am I saying it's kind of uh, an important change, the, the difference between many core and multi-core? Uh, so here I highlight the differences between the Cori system and the Edison system. And in red, I, I, I call out in particular some of, the, some of the, the key differences that I think our users need to focus on. Uh, if you compare uh, one of the Ivy Bridge processors, so the Ivy Bridge is a code name for in, uh, one of the generations of the Intel Xeon processor, to one of the Knights nice Landing processors on Core, you see that we're going from a 12 core per CPU number to 68 cores per CPU on, on Core. So that's a pretty big difference. And the difference is even wider when you compare the so-called virtual cores or hyper threads. We're going from 24 per chip on Edison to 272 on, on Cori or four per physical core. Uh, the, the, um, the, the, that's made up for a bit by the fact that the clock speed has, has been lowered. But just as importantly, I think, as having more cores, now each core is, um, is able to do more instructions per cycle. And this is typically, um, uh, expressed in terms of the vector, the vector length. So uh, on Edison, the vector length allows for four double precision operations per cycle on each each of the VPUs, and on and Cori, that number is eight. Um, and when you consider the fact that there are two VPUs, vector processing units on Cori, and you can do instructions uh, like FMAs that allow you to do multiply and add at the same time, uh, you get a total of 32 uh, double precision floating point operations you can do actually on each cycle of, of Cori. So that's a big that's a big deal and something that we have to begin to exploit in our applications. Another big difference is the fact that Cori now comes with um, uh, memory right on the chip itself, uh, and uh, and when you compare the the memory bandwidth available to applications on Edison, we're seeing about 100 gigabytes a second. And on Cori, we're seeing about four to five times that value, between 400 and 500 gigabytes per second uh, out of that fast memory that's on, on the chip. So these are all the, the, the kind of architectural changes that are coming with these many core processors. And now the question is, how do you go about optimizing your application um, targeting one of, these, one of these processors or a system built around these processors? So I'm going to start off with some basic optimization concepts that we think are important for users to grasp, particularly users coming from uh, non-HPC applications or traditional HPC applications written around sort of an MPI-only programming model and targeting our traditional HPC systems similar to the to, to, to legacy of, of Edison. Um, one of the, the initial concepts that we think is important is for users to explicitly consider not only the internode parallelism or the parallelism between the different nodes of the system, but also on node parallelism in the application. And um, a lot of people mean different things by MPI plus X. What I really mean is that, MP, that, that we want users to think about those two levels of parallelism um, separately. And we think that's important because we think that there are different bandwidths and latencies involved. Um, and, uh, and it's important to, to to differentiate those two and to, and to have a way to express both in your application. Um, so in particular, if you take a traditional M MPI application that has written with all nodes sort of more or less being treated equal, then that application may suffer from 
sort of memory overhead due to duplicated data um, that is often necessary in MPI applications, any lack of SIMD or vectorization expressiveness, um, and for example, potential latency as you scale, uh, uh, so for example, an MPI all to all code to uh, full system sizes as we approach, you know, petascale, exascale, and beyond. So there are possible solutions to this, um, and I think MPI plus MPI could be one. You can express both levels of parallelism within, within MPI. Uh, MPI plus OpenMP is a common PGAS, or MPI plus PGAS is common, and we're seeing task-based programming uh, emerge. But I think the key, the key concept here is to, to think explicitly about both levels of parallelism. So here's an example uh, use case that comes from a figure that I, I get from one of the Berkeley Lab scientists, Andrew Canning. Um, this is a code Paratech, and Paratech does big parallel 3D FFTs, and it does it via MPI and then recently MPI plus OpenMP. And uh, if you know about doing parallelizing FFTs, you know that there's an all-to-all -all step involved. And as you try to scale to more and more nodes, more and more MPI tasks, uh, eventually you end up sending very, very small messages. And what limits your performance ends up being the latency or the time to send those very small messages. Um, in this case, what they've done to improve the application is move from a pure MPI model to an MPI plus open MP model. Um, and what you're seeing here in this figure is, um, is the performance of the optimized code when running either in pure MPI over here uh, on the left um, compared to running in a mixed MPI plus open MP mode over here on the right. So over here on the right, you can see I'm running, we're running with 128 MPI tasks and six open MP threads. Um, and this turns out to be about optimal for this particular case. I think this was run on a nurse copper system where six was the number of cores in a, in a particular socket of the, of the system. Um, so in this case, the win is the fact that they have fewer MPI tasks, bigger messages, and they're reducing that, the, the, the overall latency. Okay, so that was concept number one, MPI plus X, needing to think both about internode and on-node parallelism. So big concept number two is vectorization. And this is another important form of on-node parallelism. Remember, I described Corey as being able to compute 32 operations every single cycle on the, on the processor. And what vectorization is, is fairly uh, simple to describe. If you were to take a loop like the one I have illustrated up here, AI equals BI plus CI, you can write this in sort of vector notation as a vector A equals B plus C. And so what vectorization essentially means in the CPU sense is that uh, the processor can do identical operations on different data, for example, different elements of these vectors, uh, at the same time concurrently um, uh, in, in, in each cycle. And so, for example, if you look at the vector units on common processors for the, the Ivy Bridge processor that was on the Edison, we we're able to do four double precision operations on each vector processor. Uh, on the Xeon Phi, the Knight's Landing that's in Cori, this is doubled to eight. And remember that we now have two of these vector processors per, uh, um, per core. Okay, so now, so now basically what you're looking at is a factor of eight in performance improvement, um, whether your code vectorizes or doesn't vectorize. So it's an important concept. So compilers in general want to vectorize. Um, uh, they want to vectorize your loops and your code whenever possible, but sometimes they get stumped. And so here are just a few examples that will prevent your code from vectorizing. If you have a dependency, for example, so if we change that loop that I had on the previous page to be AI equals AI minus one plus BI, well, you can see that the compiler has a hard time vectorizing this because you can't compute the ith iteration of the loop until you've computed the ith minus one. And so this dependency essentially will prevent the compiler from vectorizing this application and you'll end up with serial code. In other words, you'll have to do each iteration of the loop uh, sequentially. Another, another example is task forking. If within your loop you have if statements that change the type of instructions that are generated, um, compilers can do tricks uh, to get around this in some cases. Um, they can use masked instructions, but it's never really all that 
good to depend. Uh, it, it, it's, it's not advisable to depend on the compiler to do the right thing, um, and to and to give you vector code in all situations because the, the compiler will end up using heuristics to try to guess whether the vector code is going to be faster than the scalar code. And in my experience, in almost every case, the programmer is smarter than the compiler and and um, and knows. Uh, whether this, this this code should be vectorized or not. So it's always better to help the compiler and give it something that it can explicitly vectorize. So here's an example from a real application um, that we worked on in a hackathon uh, at NERSC not, not too long ago. It was from a real astrophysics code. We were able to profile the code using some of the tools I'll talk about in a minute and determine that this was really a CPU sensitive code. Um, it wasn't waiting on memory it was really crunching the numbers that was limiting the performance of this code. And then we, we found a fairly isolated pocket uh, within the source where the time was being spent and asked, well, is it vectorizing? And not unsurprisingly, uh, we found the answer that we found in a lot of codes that we look at for the first time, which was that the answer was no, that the, we're, the code was not vectorizing, the compiler was not generating the vector instructions. Um, and we went about looking at why. In this case, I feel that the compiler was being particularly stupid. Um, but, uh, but you can sort of see why in the fact that we had this variable n here, and we have n equals n times et plus tt. And so the, the ultimate reason the compiler said it wasn't going to vectorize was because there was a dependency on n. You couldn't do the next iteration of the loop until you had, had done the, the previous. So how did we rewrite this to help the compiler out? We made a fairly simple code transformation. With, uh, without creating too much additional memory, we created these two temporary arrays, et uh, of i and tt of i, and then manually did, a, um, did that dependency part in, a, in another loop. And you can see that these expressions here uh, where we have an exponent or a power or a number weight raised to a power were really the flop intensive part. And that's the part that we really wanted to get vectorized. Um, this actual iteration at the bottom is much less intensive and, um, and uh, in general didn't, didn't represent many of the flops. So this simple change actually sped up this entire application by 30%. The compiler was able to, to vectorize the top loop. It still wouldn't vectorize the bottom loop. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but that was enough to speed up the entire application by 30%. Okay, so here's another example um, uh, of things that prevent, your, prevent vectorization with your, in, in your application. This one comes from the XGC1, which is a fusion application that we, that we, that we worked on. So they have these two large loops out here um, that they wanted to vectorize, but the compiler said it wouldn't. And in this case, the reason why the compiler says it won't is because this is written in Fortran and they have these implicit loops here in the middle. So we have an implicit loop from one to three when you use this Fortran array syntax. And the compiler says, well, your innermost loop goes from one to three. That's not long enough. I don't want to vectorize it. So the transformation that they make from the original code to the optimized code is to reorder the, the indices. Um, split that statement from one to three up into sep in individual separate streams. And now we have a much longer inner loop. The, the compiler is able to vectorize the code and we get a 40% uh, speed up in, in, the, in the kernel. So these are just a few examples of things to look at. There are an amazing number of reasons why the compiler will decide against vectorizing your code. Um, and you almost certainly find something unique, but it's important to actually look at that, look at whether your code is being vectorized and, um, and, and look for some of these common situations. Okay, so that was big concept number two. So remember, first big concept was MPI plus X, thinking explicitly about internode and, uh, and on-node parallelism. Concept number two was vectorization, making sure that we're uh, able to use the, the vector compilers uh, efficiently. And then big concept number three I want to talk about is memory bandwidth. And in particular, understanding how your application um, uses the memory system and the bandwidth that your application requires.
So if you consider this, uh, the, the following loop that I have uh, on this page, and let's assume that N and M are very, very large, such that we don't, that, that the arrays A and B are, are far too big to fit into any level of cache on the processor. And I'll discuss a little bit about what that means in a second. Um, then what happens during the execution of this loop is that the number of loads, the number of data that, that, that ultimately has to come in from DRAM is N times M plus M. So basically for every, for every iteration of the outer loop N, we have to essentially stream the entire array B in from DRAM, from memory, over and over again. So that's where you get this N times M, uh, M N times M factor. Okay, so let's look at the performance of this on a, a processor on NERSC existing system, Edison, for example. Uh, so if we assume that these are double precision, um, then each one of those values would require eight bytes to be loaded from memory. And assuming that we have multiply add instructions, that means we'd have to have eight bytes for every multiply add um, that we perform as supported. Okay, so let's, let's go to the Edison webpage. So if you Google Nurse Edison, you'll find on the description uh, on the front page of of that, of that Edison page that each node on Edison supports up to 100 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth um, uh, uh, on, on each node. Okay, so if we assume that we can at most send from memory to the processor 100 gigabytes per second of data, then what that means is that we can at most achieve 25 gigaflops per second because remember we had two flops for every eight bytes. So, um, so that says that this loop will perform at best at 25 gigaflops per second. Now, if you go to that same webpage on Edison and you look at what we claim the theoretical performance on each Edison node is, you will see that it says 460 gigaflops per second. Um, so what's going on? There's some big gap between the maximum performance this code can achieve and the maximum performance we're claiming an Edison node can achieve. And in this case, what we mean here is the conclusion is that this loop is, is ultimately limited in performance by the memory bandwidth. So we call this a memory bandwidth um, uh, uh, piece of code or a memory bandwidth kernel. Um, one of the things that we've been using a lot at Berkeley and at NERSC is, is the following model for understanding performance. This is a model that will help you uh, predict the, the theoretical performance that your application can achieve given a certain characteristics. So on the x-axis is a quantity that we call the operational intensity. So this is something that you can measure or estimate from your, from your source code. And it's, it's measured in flops per byte. So if we go back to that previous page for, that, for the loop that I showed, remember we had two flops, one multiply and one add, for, for eight bytes that need to be read in from memory. So in this case, the operational intensity for that application is 0 0.25 or one, or one quarter. So we're over here on this x-axis. Now the other lines tell you the attainable gigaflops um, per second that you could get, uh, that you can expect out of such an algorithm. So in our case, we go over to 0 0.25, which is right here, and then we go up and we'd find the ceiling um, and we'd find that we should be able to achieve about 25 gigaflops per second. I think that's what this, this line would, would intersect with, uh, with the y-axis at. These other ceilings, um, so there are three different lines here where I show the, the, expected, the, the performance that you can expect out of your algorithm if you have different characteristics. If we go over here to the right, meaning we have more flops per bytes, then you could intersect with a few different ceilings. The first is this green ceiling, which is uh, a code that doesn't vectorize and also doesn't have multiply any multiply add symmetry, so can't use those advanced instructions. This next ceiling would be a code that does vectorize, but does have multiply add balance, so can use the multiply add instructions. And then finally, if you're doing everything right, 
the best performance that you could possibly get on the system would be this 460 gigaflops per second, which is what we publish on the on the web page. So unfortunately for us, our code is way over here for right now. Um, and uh, and the question is, what do we go? How how do we go about improving that? Um, so really quickly, I just want to talk about the processor kind of memory hierarchy on a multi-core system like Edison. You can see that each Edison processor, the Ivy Ridge processor, has 12 cores per chip. Um, each each core has access to its own L1 and L2 cache. They share an L3 cache, and then uh, if your data is too big for that for those levels of cache, as it was in our loop example, that data will, will reside out in the in the in the DRAM of the system, and there may be multiple channels to for the, for that to come in. So what can we do in in our case? The one of the things to target is is attempting to improve what we call the memory locality in your application. Um, or reducing the amount of data that you ultimately have to bring in from DRAM. So uh, real quick, Jack, there was a question on okay. the Google Docs. Uh -huh. I think a little more explanation on the, the loop on the left. They were asking specifically, why is the number of loads <coughs> n times m plus n? Right. So maybe you could just go into details a little bit more on that before you talk about how to fix it. Okay. Well, this is a good slide to be on to answer that question, I think. so. Um, <clears throat> So the n times m part comes from the fact that for each outer loop i, we have to stream through the entire array b, which is of size m. So for every single value of i, we stream through the array b, which is n times m. The additional factor of the, the plus n there comes from the fact that we essentially have to stream through a once. So we get to reuse the value of a for every value of the inner loop, but we still have to stream through it essentially once. For the, for the outer uh, loop. Uh, so I hope that, that answers the question. So going from there to the right, what we can do to improve the locality is to try to get rid of that fact that we have to stream through B every single time. Um, and one of, the, one of the traditional ways to do that is to add a level of blocking, uh, which, which is commonly called cache blocking, sometimes called tiling, depending on your geometry. So in this case, what we do is we do a little trick where we split the J loop up. So instead of going all the way from 1 to M in the innermost loop, we do it in chunks. So we split the J loop basically up into two, and we stick the I loop in the middle. So you can see that now as we execute this code, we, uh, for every single value of I, we go through chunks of J, and then we iterate on I, and then we reuse that chunk of A. So if you choose the size of block such that it fits into one of your lower levels of cache, the L3, the L2, or the L1, so that basically you can hold all of array B within that chunk in one of those lower levels of cache, then you don't have to bring it in from ma main memory every sing for every single iteration of I. You basically get to reuse it for every single value of I. So if you look at the amount of loads from DRAM in this case, what we have now is a reduction. We have, uh, we have to bring in M divided by block um, uh, uh, values of, of A, and then there's, there's basically N plus block of those. So the total amount of data is N times M divided by block. So, uh, so the win here is that the amount of data that has to be read from DRAM has gone down by roughly a factor of the block size that you've chosen. And so that block size is limited in principle by the size of the cache that you have on the, on the processor. So the good news here is that your application, when you plot it on this roofline model, has now moved from an operational intensity of one fourth to an operational intensity of that number uh, multiplied by the block size. So you've moved your application on this roofline model from the left to the right, and now available to your application is a much higher ceiling. Um, if that, uh, and then you, you might have to look at further optimizations in order to reach that 460 number in, in principle. Okay, so that, those are the three um, concepts I wanted to talk about. So the first was 
Again, MPI plus X, internode plus on node parallelism explicitly. Second big concept was vectorization, making sure we're using the vector compiler. And the third was really memory bandwidth and understanding your memory bandwidth requirements and how to improve the cache locality. Okay, so now that, we, that we've gone over the concepts, let me talk about the strategy that we've been developing here at NERSC to take these concepts, apply them to applications, and end up with hopefully more optimized code at the, at the end of the day. And real quick, Jack, there was uh -huh. a question, but we had already gone past the vectorization slides, and I'm sure you're going to come to it. It was about whether, uh, to how, how would you find out whether a loop is vectorizing or not? Right. So that's actually a really good question. I think I mentioned it at a future slide. Um, one of the, I think one of the good ways is to look at the compiler report. So both the Cray and Intel compilers that we use commonly here at, at, at NERSC have an optimization report that they can print out for each, each, uh, each source file that they compile, and it'll straight up tell you what, if it vectorized a loop, and if not, why not? Um, and it'll give you a somewhat um, a poor estimate on what it thinks the speed up of vectorization was. Um, so, so that's probably the easiest way to find out, is just to actually look at the compiler report. And I think on a future slide, I have the little flag to add to the compiler to to, to figure that out. Great, thank you. Okay, so this now we come to the to the ant farm. Uh, <laughs> so we spent a long time at NERSC thinking of coming up with a nice analogy of what optimization, what optimizing code was like um, that we could kind of sell to the users, and we came up with staircases and space elevators and all sorts of other analogies. Um, and, you know, the, the truth is that none of them, it, it's never as simple as that. It's, 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 optimizing code is always messy. And so <laughs> I think that the, the best analogy that we ended up coming up with was the ant farm. And this is apparently the kind of out of the box idea that gets you a promotion around here. Um, but it, it really, it really, I think, does a good job describing the, the process in a, in a few ways. So. The, the the lawnmower is you and 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 the, the the development team going through the application and constantly profiling and and debugging and finding what the the current um, tallest blade of grass is and those tallest blades of grass are basically the bottlenecks in your in your application that you want to cut down and 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 and, and analyze so. You have these profiling tools running constantly over the lawn, finding these tall blades of grass, and then you have the ants bringing these, bringing these blades of grass into their um, labyrinth and applying different techniques to, for, for optimization. We've, we've kind of turned this into a flow chart that we think uh, different application teams can follow to, to optimize um, their applications and to learn what What's uh, what's ultimately limiting the performance and how to go and how to go about uh, tackling it? You know, one of the important things to 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 take away from this is not to kind of just glom onto the idea that these many core processors have big vector units. I must vectorize my my application because in some cases that might not be what's actually limiting your performance. And so. The real key takeaway here is that it's important to profile, it's important to determine what's limiting your performance, and to use that to guide your optimization strategy. And so that's what this flowchart that we've developed has, um, is, is sort of going about uh, attempting to, to, to strategize. So the first question, or one of the first questions that comes up when you find a kernel that sticks out, one of these blades of grass that's taking up uh, a lot of your time, is are you memory bound, are you compute bound, or are you just something else? And um, I think one of the great ways to go about doing this is to determine your position on the roof line for this, um, for this kernel or this hotspot in your application. We've put together a really detailed page on how to do this, um, which I put the URL on this, on this slide. It's, um, it's it, unfortunately, it's a little bit um, convoluted at this point to compute both the, the, the memory traffic that you need to, to, to have and also to compute your flops. 
Uh, but it can be done. Um, there's a couple of tools that we're using right now from Intel called SDE and VTune that do it. And this page has good, uh, clear instructions on, on how to go about doing that. So there are a couple other ways to, to figure out if your memory bandwidth found. Um, one is you can run VTune itself and just compute your memory bandwidth. VTune actually has a very nice um, a view of, of uh, the bandwidth that your application is using over the course of its run. So this is the view that you're seeing here. And you can basically just watch how much bandwidth you're using during your application run. And one way to determine if your memory bandwidth bound is to essentially compare this to what you would get um, to what we have written on our web page as a theoretical bandwidth that the hardware supports. <clears throat> or you could run a little test code called stream, which essentially does nothing but bring in data from, from main memory to the processor. And if you're somewhere close to that, to that value, either the value that we publish on our website or the value that you get with stream, then it's pretty safe to say that your, your memory bandwidth is limited. Um, but we've also developed a few uh, little simple tests that you can run. Um, without uh, having to dig into any profiling tools at all that will help explain, uh, that will help determine whether your memory bandwidth bound, compute bound, both or neither. Um, and the first is to do this, to do a simple example, choose a problem uh, where you can run on, for example, one node on, uh, let's say, for example, the Edison supercomputer system or any supercomputer system that you have access to and compare the performance you get running on one node using all of the cores versus running on two nodes using only half of the cores. Um, so you can see that this is the, so if you have a system that uses AP run, this is the syntax that you would, you, that you would use to, uh, to, to achieve that. So in this case, on the left, we basically have a node where we're using only half the cores. In this case, we have a node where we're using, we have, um, one node we're using all the cores versus again on the left two nodes where we use half the cores on each. And the conclusion here is that if your performance changes, you are at least partially memory bandwidth bound. So the biggest change between these two scenarios is that the, the case on the left where you're running on across two nodes, each core essentially has access to twice as much memory bandwidth. The first order, that's the biggest change. There are also other changes in the sense that you have uh, uh, a larger amount of shared L3 cache in, in the second case. But the first order, biggest change, is that there's more memory bandwidth available to two nodes than there is to one node. So if this makes a big difference for your code, chances are your memory bandwidth bound. So here's an example from the Quantum Espresso application where we run when packed mode, that means using all the cores on the node, versus unpacked node mode, where we use uh, twice as many nodes, but with half as many cores per node. And you can see that that makes, in this case, about a 20% difference. Uh, and we conclude that this code is, is fairly significantly memory bandwidth bound. Okay, another test you can do, which is sort of the corollary to this, is you can actually just reduce the CPU speeds um, that uh, reduce the CPU speed that your that the processor uses during your computation, um, but uh, but don't reduce it uh, to a point that it affects the memory system. And so in this case, uh, we we again show the Cray AP run syntax. So if you have a Cray system where you use ELPS, this um, this would be the syntax for you. You can specify the processor clock speed here. So we're comparing 2.4 gigahertz to, to 1.9 gigahertz on the Edison system here. And then the conclusion here is that if your performance changes, then you're at least partially compute bound because you haven't changed the amount of bandwidth that's available to you. All you've done is slowed down the actual CPU. And so if your performance changes significantly here, the conclusion is that you depend on the CPU, the CPU, uh, you're not 100% bandwidth bound. So if you were to run, for example, stream or that loop that I showed earlier, you would find that there's no difference in the performance from this test. And Jack, there was a question uh -huh. by David Bross 
uh, yes, can the compilers do this sort of optimization to fit instructions in cache? So the memory optimizations you were talking about in the cache blocking loop? Right. So, uh, so some compilers do have an attempt to add blocking. I believe the Cray, the Cray compiler is one. Um, I would just once again warn that it's, it's almost never a good idea to just depend on the compiler to do this for you because the code is almost never as simple as that, you know, five lines that I, that I had pasted there. So while in some cases the, the compiler will attempt to vectorize, uh, it's almost never a good idea to just depend on that happening. Um, okay. So, um, You've run these tests. You've determined that your memory bandwidth is bound. So now what do you do? So what, what, where does our flow chart take you? Um, I think you have essentially two options right now when you're targeting a many core system like Knight's Landing. The first is to try to improve your, your, your memory locality or your ability to reuse data out of cache. Um, this uh, is what we we did when we added that layer of cache blocking to our little loop when we were going through the, the concepts. And essentially what this is doing is moving your algorithm from the left to the right on the roof line model. So this is step one is to really fundamentally look at your algorithm and see if, if there's a way for you to improve the, the memory locality. So step two is if you determine that you fundamentally have the best algorithm you can possibly have already. There's no way to improve it. Then what you want to do is identify the key arrays that are leading to your high memory bandwidth usage and make sure that they are or will be allocated into that high bandwidth memory that I was advertising existed on the night's landing. So remember that memory that is four to five times the bandwidth of the, of the Edison uh, memory system. And if you can do this, then you can profit by getting basically five times or four to five times the bandwidth of, uh, on, on the night's landing processor than you get on the, on the, on the Edison Ivy Bridge processor. Okay, so what if you're compute bound? Uh, so if you determine that you're compute bound, then the things to do are to make sure you have good OpenMP scalability. You want to make sure you're using all of the cores on the, on the processor. Um, I like this tool VTune that Intel provides. So it's another profiling application that will let you look at your thread activity um, for your different OpenMP regions. And so what you're seeing here is sort of a histogram of when VTune sampled your application, how many threads were actively doing something. Um, so this was a case where we're running on a system with I think 60 cores. And so you can see that it's not particularly good. At any given time, we're averaging only about 32 of those those cores being active. Um, so this can be pretty instructive. You can also, you also want to make sure that you're not only using all the cores, but you're using them efficiently and that you're using the vector processing units efficiently. So you look at, you, you want to see if your code is vectorizing. Um, VTune, uh, the same VTune run that will show you that plot above will tell you the, the vector utilization. It'll essentially tell you how many vectors vector lanes you were actively using on average in a similar way to, to, to how it tells you how many cores you are actively using on average. And Jack, real quick, uh -huh. a lot of the VTune training and documentation is on the NERSC website, right? Right. Okay, good. So if people want more details, they can go there. Right. Um, okay, and then here's the answer to the question that was asked earlier, which is how do you tell if, you're, if the compiler is giving you vector code for your loop? And uh, the recommendation is to add this QOpt report equals five. Um, and this will tell you the, uh, it'll, it basically will pr provide you with a list of all the loops in your source file, whether it was vectorized or not, and ultimately why, if, if not, uh, which I think can be, can be really informative. Okay, and so there are other reasons why you might uh, you might be below your roofline ceiling um, than just the fact that you're not vectorizing. For example, if you have if you have instructions that have high latency, for example, like a divide instruction or a power an exponent, um, you might find yourself below, below the roofline, um, but still having good vector code or having 
uh, uh, um, but, but not otherwise needing to optimize the code. Okay, so are you latency bound? Um, so in some cases, you may not be bandwidth bound, you might not be CPU bound, you might be something else. A good way to find if you're latency bound, um, is could be memory latency bound, um, there are some other kinds of latency that you could be uh, ultimately limited by. But one, one, one simple test to see if this is a likely case is to try running with, um, with hyper-threading turned on on a system like Edison, uh, for example. So you might compare your performance with, if you have, a, a, again, a Cray system with ALP, the AP run minus J2 versus just AP run on a, on a fixed set of nodes. And so what this will do is it will turn on hyper-threading, which gives you access to two threads per core on the, on the processors on, on Edison. Okay, so if you turn on hyper-threading and it improves your performance, chances are you have some kind of latency that you're hiding by, by using more threads. So what happens here is that when one thread is, is, um, is, is being limited by latency or is waiting to do a, a lookup, then the other thread can be actively doing work. And so what you end up doing is hiding that latency by using multiple threads. So the good news here is that on the nice landing processors, for example, on the upcoming Cori system, each core will support up to four threads. And if you're fundamentally latency bound, you might consider using them all. Um, and this, there, there are, of course, caveats and limits here in the sense that um, there's a, there's a limit to the amount of instructions that you can have in, in flight. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly if you have kind of scatter gather type operations, uh, there's a limit to the amount of those you can have in flight. However, this is, is typically a good way to, to test if, if latency is, uh, is something that's limiting you and, and a reasonable way to overcome it. Okay. So, uh, are there any more questions about that? So that's, that's essentially the end of the optimization strategy um, part of the, of the talk. And I'll go into a case study. And I know that we have about 10 minutes left, um, but I want to make sure we get any questions answered about the strategy first. There weren't any additional questions okay. right now. I was actually going to ask the latency one, so thank you for addressing that. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about one one use case here. I'm going to talk about the Berkeley, a Berkeley GW use case, and it's kind of near and dear to my heart since I'm one of the developers of this project. So this started off a few years ago as an MPI-only application, um, as many of the applications that we run here at NERSC are. It targets uh, it was targeting big systems that could scale pretty well to many nodes, but we were already starting to see the breakdown of the pure MPI model within our application. And I think it's similar to a lot of applications where in order to reduce the amount of communication, we end up duplicating some data structures on each MPI task. Um, and ultimately this leads to, to, to overhead and the, the, the overhead is such that um, it, it limited the, the size of systems that our, that our users could practically study. Um, they'd often be forced to, to, to resort to a scenario where they use less than the full number of cores for the calculation in order to give each MPI task more, more memory. And this is something that's not, I think, just, uh, just common to Berkeley GW, but common to a lot of applications that users will end up running with less than the full number of cores per node to, to increase their memory. So we wanted to move to, an, to, a, uh, to this MPI plus X model. And we were thinking a little bit farther ahead. We wanted to, to add OpenMP in a way that, that didn't just target, you know, a handful of threads, but really targeted tens to hundreds of threads. Um, and, we, and we went about doing that. I'm going to describe one of the computational bottlenecks that we found and how we went about optimizing it. You don't have to memorize this formula. Thank you. <laughs> what, what I want you to take away from this formula is that we have a bunch of arrays on the right-hand side and essentially a single number on the left-hand side. So we're basically collapsing information from a bunch of different arrays and ending up with a single number on the left. So this is sort of a tensor contraction or matrix reduction type operation that we're optimizing. Um, 
This is the optimization path we we uh, we went about um, performing, and this is a little bit like um, ruining the ending. But I want to make sure that we that that this sort of gets across at the beginning. So we started off by refactoring the code. We, we targeted a, a form that had three loops: an outer loop for MPI, a long inner loop for OpenMP, and then still a long uh, innermost loop that we're targeting for the vectorization. We went about adding the OpenMP after doing that refactoring. Um, and at this point, we can really fit the problem on, onto, the, onto the Xeon 5 processors and get a reasonable answer. We asked at this point, like many people do, is my code vectorizing? And found that the answer was no. Even though we had targeted a loop for vectorization, the compiler had found a way not to give it to us. Um, so that, uh, so we went about um, sort of removing some of the conditionals, doing some of the loop reordering, which I'll show in a minute, to, to, to enforce vectorization and to allow the compiler to vectorize. Uh, and you can see that that made a significant difference. Both, not in, the, the speed up in this case doesn't entirely come from vectorization alone, but comes from some of the, um, improvements around vectorization that we had to make to the, to the application. We add a level of cache blocking, which I'll talk about in a minute, and then finally explore hyper-threading. And uh, at the end of the day, we're able to um, uh, speed up this particular piece of code, which hadn't really been optimized at all, by a truly massive amount. And, um, and then the optimized code ultimately gets better performance on the night's landing than the traditional Haswell processors. Um, but Jack, to interject, even then the Haswell processor performance was a massive improvement. Right. So I think one of the take home messages is that as you target improvements for many core systems, you really end up improving your code like sort of across the board on all, on all processors. Okay, so what did, what do we have to do to ensure vectorization in this particular case? Um, here is an example of the final structure of the application. I want to highlight a few a few areas of the, of the code. Um, one of the areas I want to highlight is at the top here, the loop that we targeted for OpenNP. It has a nice long trip count from hundreds to a thousand. Um, it's fairly well balanced. Uh, it's good for, for 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 having threads on the order of tens to hundred. One of the next things I want to point out is that this loop here, I, IW equals one to N freak, where N freak is quietly set to three, or I guess not quietly, but it's set to three at somewhere during the runtime. Um, this was the inner, this was the original innermost loop uh, in the application. And this is what the compiler attempted to vectorize. And the problem is, is that the loop is just too small to give good vector performance. Um, you end up having to worry a lot about memory alignment issues and um, the fact that your the loop is smaller than the vector unit um, means it doesn't officially use the uh, can't, can't officially use the registers, and so that wasn't a good choice for vectorization. So what we ended up doing is pulling that out and coming up with a new inner loop that goes from IG equals a thousands to ten thousands. Um, and that turned out to be really good for vectorization. We didn't have to worry about alignment too much. Um, but even then, the code didn't really vectorize because we had a bunch of spurious logic in there that um, uh, would basically short circuit the loop if we decided that a particular iteration wasn't going to contribute in a meaningful way. And this makes a lot of sense when you're thinking sequentially. You want to save cycles. But when you're thinking in a vector world, this is the sort of thing that doesn't make sense. What it just does is prevent your code from doing anything in parallel and, um, and ultimately slows you down. So these were the changes that we made from that step, um, <clears throat> from in, in that vectorization step, which I call step between two and three. And you can see that if we plot our position on the roof line in these two cases, if we look at the roof line on a traditional Xeon processor, Haswell, versus the nice landing processor, we've moved up in both cases. That's good. Um, on, the, on the Haswell, we actually even moved a little bit to the right. On the K&L, it's interesting that while the absolute performance 
improved quite a bit. Um, we ended up moving to the left on the roof line. We somehow made our data locality worse. And interestingly, you can see that there are two lines here for the KNL. One represents when we run our problem entirely out of the slower DRAM versus running it out entirely out of the faster MCDRAM. And you can see that when running entirely out of the DRAM, we're right here on this horizontal curve or this sort of diagonal curve, I, I should say. And that means that we essentially hit the ceiling uh, for, for DRAM for that problem. So we're at, at this point memory bandwidth bound. Um, and you're probably ask, asking why, in one case, did we move to the right, and in the other case, did we move to the left? Well, one of the big differences between Knight's Landing and Haswell, or traditional Xeon processor, is the lack of L3 on the L3 cache on the Knight's Landing. So in this case, what we've done is we've heard our data locality, and you can see exactly how we did that. We, we've changed our code to have the following form, where we've moved that IW equals one to three loop from the inside to the outside. And when you look at what's going on in that new inner loop, where we have IG equals one to something like 10,000, in this particular benchmark run, what we found was that we required essentially 512 kilobytes per row of three arrays um, <clears throat> to be reused um, in order. To, uh, so, so we would like a cache size that has 512 times three uh, in order to reuse the, the rows of these arrays for each one of those three, the IW equals one to three value. So a couple of quick questions. Okay. Uh, one was ILP. What is that? Ah. That was back one slide. Sorry. Okay. So ILP, I'm counting. Uh, it, it's sort of a. I'm using it a little bit loosely. It stands for instruction level parallelism. So this provides a level of four reduction on both Haswell and KNL. And what's included in there is that multiply add symmetry. So if you can use the. FMA instructions, as well as the fact that we have two VPUs. So if you can keep both of those VPUs busy. Got it. Sorry about that. Um, and then one more question on the next slide, okay. or at least you're getting to again. Uh -huh. it, it was about the cache blocking and does it make the <laughs> does it make the code less portable across different machines? So in in a in a sense it it might. Um, so cache blocking in general doesn't make your code less portable, but you have to but the optimal block size may be different for different architectures. Um, and so that might be something that goes into like your make file where you set a, a block size uh, potentially. Um, so in this case, what we find is that uh, we're able to reuse these three rows on Haswell out of the L3 cache but it doesn't fit into the L2 cache on either KNL or KNC or, or Haswell. So it's too big for any processor's L2. We're saved by the L3 on Haswell, and that's why we don't see the, the shift to the left on our roof line for Haswell, but we do see it on the, on the right. So what we did is exactly what I talked about earlier, is we added a level of cache blocking here. So we do this inner loop um, in chunks that are big enough to give good vector performance, but not too big to spill out of cash. Um, and you see that we end up speeding up the application quite a bit and improving our locality. So if we look at step the, the performance here between step three and four, on Haswell it makes almost no difference because of the L3 cache. And on um, Knight's Landing, you see we moved our, our performance back to the right on the roof line model due to that cache blocking layer. Okay, so I think I'm just about out of time, and that's good because we're just about at the end of the story. So the last thing I'll say is we, we looked at hyper-threading and a few other uh, small improvements to the vectorization at the end, and now the final performance for this application uh, is represented by dot six on these curves. And if you're asking why aren't we hitting the roof line on either Haswell or K now, why, why are we not at the ceiling? The answer here appears to be that we have divides, and divides count as one flop but take multiple cycles to, to compute. And so that's what's ultimately limiting the performance in this case now. Okay, so I'm at the end. The conclusions, I think, are that optimizing code is definitely not uh, always straightforward. In my experience, it almost never is straightforward. 
it's really a continual discovery process that involves uh, you know, sequential and coupled changes, and um, it's important to use tools and to not get stuck with one idea of what 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 uh, what your code needs, but to really look at uh, your hotspots and determine uh, in a quantitative way what is limiting your performance. Um, okay, and so that's the end, and I think I'll put up the slide for for Hans to. To go over. Great. Thanks a lot, Jack. I really appreciate it. It's hard to cover such uh, detailed material so quickly. Uh, so just to remind everyone, <laughs> please do send uh, an email back to that email that you see there. Uh, again, we'd love for you to get counted by going to the bit.ly URL that's also there, hpcbp-s07. Uh, the slides are already available and the recording will be available soon. And uh, this is the last webinar in the series. So if you have feedback or specific requests, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Uh, and uh, uh, help us uh, schedule important topics for us to discuss in the future. So thanks again to Jack, and uh, we hope to hear from you soon.